Now, the small salt mining city of Bakhmut in eastern Ukraine is the latest focus of the war, with Russian advances being held back for the moment. But the situation is increasingly severe after months of bombardment, with reports of a possible Ukrainian withdrawal, as it could soon be encircled. Well, we're joined now by the former Chief of the General Staff, the former Head of the British Army, General Lord Richard Dannett. Always a pleasure to have you uh, on the programme. Thank you for coming on uh, on a Sunday. We're talking about Bakhmut. What's your understanding about the latest of that situation? Well, it would seem to me that the Ukrainians are coming to a very sensible tactical decision that to withdraw rather than run the risk of being completely encircled um, now makes sense. Uh, frankly, Bakhmud has been the focus of fierce fighting since last autumn. Uh, it's worth remembering that um, it was the Wagner Group under Prudozin that um, really wanted to try and show to the Russian army that they could achieve a victory, whether it which the Russian army couldn't. Well, this has dragged on now for a better part of six months with huge loss of life on the Russian side. So from the Ukrainian perspective, you could say that with Bakhmud, pretty much smashed to pieces now as a town, as a city. There's nothing really worth defending. Um, strategically, it's not very significant, but it's achieved its aim of effectively being the anvil on which so many Russian lives have been broken. And therefore, it makes complete sense for the Ukrainians now to withdraw to a more defensible line uh, and continue the battle there. Because the really key thing, the overall thing, is that the Ukrainians need to hold the Russians while the Russians mount their current offensives. And I don't think we've really seen the, the real meat of that yet. So that at some point in the late spring, early summer, the Ukrainians can learn to mount a really strong counter-offensive utilizing the modern equipment that we're now giving them. That's really interesting, actually, about how you explain the kind of spread of the war and the kind of strategy uh, going on. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about a Ru Russian spring offensive. How would you say that is going? Well, I don't think we've really seen it start yet. Um, if they are serious about launching a new offensive, and I'm sure they are because they've got to try and move the war along in some positive direction from the Kremlin's point of view. And they've recruited and brought in maybe a couple of hundred thousand, maybe as many as 300,000 additional into their army. And of course, we remember these will be very poorly trained. We know they've been very poorly equipped and they're very poorly led. It's going to lead to significant loss of life on the Russian side. Many Russian families have got to find that their husbands, sons or other young people have been taken away from them as the Ukrainians sit on the strategic defence for a while and allow the Russians to throw themselves into the teeth of, of their firepower. It's when that uh, has reached its climax and the, as we would say, the Russians have culminated in their offensive, which I don't think will be for a little while yet. That's the moment that the Ukrainians must turn the table on them and use the uh, Leopard 2 tanks, the Challenger tanks we've given them, the armored infantry fighting vehicles, the self-propelled artillery and the like um, to mount a really decisive, potentially decisive counter-offensive. And I think that uh, I'm not alone in believing that a few decisive blows struck at certain points along that very extended front on the Russian army could well have the effect of breaking the morale of the Russian soldier and breaking the back of the Russian army. The, the thing is, you don't have to defeat an army in detail everywhere on the battlefield. You've just got to convince enough of its soldiers that they've lost. And when they think they've lost, they have lost. That's so interesting. And, and, and for you talking about, you know, the loss of life on the Russian side as well and how that's going to trickle back, of course, because all of these men are going to have families as well in Russia. Uh, and that's going to impact things as well, obviously. Um, you're talking about these decisive moments uh, coming up uh, when Ukraine can use the weapons and the firepower that it's been given. Do you think the West has done enough uh, in getting the equipment that Ukraine needs to the front line? To be frank, I don't think we've done enough. Um, we need to do as much as we possibly can to ensure that this war is concluded this year. And... Well, the debate has agonised for quite some time when eventually the Germans, I think rather encouraged by us, decided to give Leopard 2 tanks. A number of other countries have followed that. The American Abrams tanks won't be available for quite some time. And frankly, fighter jets won't be available for quite some time. So this counteroffensive by the Ukrainians is going to have to go with what they've got. Bear in mind, they've got a lot of their own equipment still. They've got a lot of Russian equipment that they've captured, which clever Ukrainian mechanics will have refurbished and made available. So that showing their characteristic determination 
they're much better operational planning, they're much better battlefield leadership and discipline. I think there's every prospect that the Ukrainians can mount a successful counteroffensive, probably, as I said, late spring, early summer. And um, provided that's planned properly and seen through, and we continue to give them as much equipment and ammunition as they need, then there is a chance of having some decisive outcome on the battlefield this year. None of us want to be here, Sophie, this time next year, discussing a war that's in the deep freeze and dragging on in a First World War attritional type nature. Yeah, absolutely right on that. Um, you're talking now about the need or the desire to try and conclude the war this year. But what does an end game look like? Because, you know, frankly, you know, I can't imagine Putin just being like, OK, right, this is all a terrible mistake. I'm just going to get the guys out. That's it. Let's pretend it never happened. Well, I'd like to think that if the counteroffensive by the Ukrainians is sufficiently well planned, supported and executed, that Putin won't be in a position to do too much decision making himself. That if his army crumbles and runs, then I think it's quite likely that he'll be swept out of the Kremlin as well. And you also have to then ask the question, which everybody does, is, well, if it's not going to be Putin in the Kremlin, who is it going to be? Well, to be honest, I don't really know the answer to that question. But what I would say is I think the group of people, the group of leaders who are most disaffected in Russia at the present moment are the senior generals. Uh, they've seen Putin totally interfere with a war they probably don't largely agree with. They realise that their weaponry is distinctly inferior to that of the West, and that's largely through the corruption in the Russian defence procurement process. So I could see General Gerasimov, the chief of the general staff, who's now been put in charge in overall command uh, in, in Ukraine itself, to be the one, if he could make a sufficiently sensible plan and have the moral courage to see it through, it could be the generals that topple, uh, that topple Putin and push him out of the Kremlin. Um, there's going to be a lot of change in Russia over the next 12 months, I've got no doubt. That's fascinating. And actually, one of the sort of few times that you can hear someone actually uh, arguing a way forward um, that you can actually imagine happening. So, well, as you say, there's going to be a lot of changes to come. We're going to have to see how that unfolds. I just want to talk a little bit about the UK uh, defence, if I may, as well. Are you concerned that sending so much ammunition, tanks, obviously there's talk about jets in the future as well, whether that could put the UK's defence capability at risk? Well, I mean, also by definition, it does. But then you have to ask the next question, which does it matter? Um, I mean, who do we think we might have to be fighting this year, next year, whatever? Um, the answer is difficult to tell. Um, it could well be Russia. But the war with Russia is currently going on and Ukraine is fighting it. So it makes complete sense that we support Ukraine to the maximum. <clears throat> but the really important thing, or the additional important thing, is that we are firing up British industry to make sure that we're placing orders to replace our stock of N-law anti-tank weapons, uh, all ranges of ammunition, and ask ourselves bigger questions about our land warfare capability. Do we have plans for enough main battle tanks in our armory? Do we have sensible plans for the next generation of infantry fighting vehicles? And I think many of us would actually think that our plans are not sufficient and that the refresh of the integrated review, which is due to be published this week, and then the budget next week, Frankly, I and others hope that we will see an increase in defence spending and a significant proportion of that will go on replenishing our land warfare stocks and improving our overall land warfare capability. Yeah, it's interesting. There's lots of talk, isn't there, about what will happen with the defence budget. The Sunday Times reporting today, Rishi Sunak is set to announce a multi-billion pound uplift to the defence budget during potentially a trip to the US. Um, ben Wallace reportedly wants £11 billion over two years. I mean, that's not going to happen, is it? I don't see why it shouldn't. It's, um, it's a lot of money, but it's actually in the totality of everything. It's not a vast and impossible amount of money. Yes, of course, it's got to come from somewhere. And there are a lot of other demands on the government's finances for money elsewhere. But at the end of the day, uh, the security of the nation, the safety of our citizens is the number one responsibility of government. And defence, although some can argue it's fairly well funded, the balance within defence is not right. There is a deficiency in our land warfare fighting capability. OK, you can say, Sophie, he would say that, wouldn't he? Because he used to be in charge of the army. But it's a fact that most independent observers would agree with, that the army has been the poor cousin in terms of investment over the last 10, 15 years. And frankly, if we want to have a credible army, that's got to change. OK, thank you very much. It's always really interesting to get your perspective. Thank you. Thanks, Sophie.